Right, we're going to pick up where we left off, studying social cognition. This is a fascinating topic and one that alerts us to the fact that we have very far to go before we have any decent science of ourselves. We noted, that I apologize for the color on the screens by the way, that's just what's happening. We noted the last time that most of our psychological theories assume the minds are separate, distinct, discrete, individual, private, hidden, isolated things. And in that case, any approach to social phenomena is limited, necessarily limited. This assumption that minds are discrete, separate, private, leads to a particular way, manner of treating social phenomena that, as we're going to see, is very, very problematic. And one thing we're also going to see is that we're not restricted to the what I'm going to call the solipsistic view of mind as being separate, discrete, individual, and private. We've met this controversy before. We've seen, as you see here on the left, approaches which assume that the world and the knower of that world are entirely separate and that the world sort of leaks in and must be represented to the subject in the brain. That's a thoroughly conventional approach to understanding what minds, brains, and bodies are, and the world is. But it's not a scientifically established fact. <coughs> it's a framework. We've also met approaches that emphasize the direct contact between a subject and its world, that obviate or get around the need to represent the world, and that focus instead on looking at mind as an expression of the interaction between a, an embodied individual and its environment. These represent different frameworks within which one can begin to understand people. To assume that one or other has priority or is the only way to the truth is severely problematic. And we're going to see today some stark examples of what goes wrong if scientists claim a kind of authority to themselves that they don't have by insisting that one or other framework, in fact that the far framework, is the only one, and that they are capable then of drawing inferences that tell people how they should lead their lives. This is kind of an overreach that science tends to sometimes. The last day we briefly covered the, bi the notion of biological determinism. We looked at a small biological difference, the white of the eye, that has changed the situation for humans greatly, providing us with situations of joint attention and ensuring that we adopt common perspectives on the world so that our goings-on are greatly uh, coordinated among ourselves. And we distinguish between the kind of social organization found in insect societies, the eusocial animals like termites and ants and bees, and we looked at the naked mole rat, and we distinguish that from the rather shocking goings-on in bonobo society um, and primates generally, where primates um, are, have flexible social roles that always need to be tended. These are, these are always subject to negotiation and much of what we do um, arises from um, jockeying for position, arguing that we need to have this role or that role, trying to better ourselves, protect ourselves against others, forming allegiances, being political. This is what primates do. We're not like ants. And under those conditions, biology is a very poor guide when it comes to deciding what constitutes uh, some kind of a natural order for humans. No such thing exists. In the 19th century, there was this view of... Uh, this, this, well, sorry, before the 19th century, it's an old view going back several hundreds of years ago, that there's such a thing as the state of nature. And that you, you could imagine humans in a state of nature and civilized humans are somewhat corrupted. It's a re ridiculous religious view that doesn't um, bear... bear we, we, won't, we won't find any scientific favor. But we'll find its influence again and again in science, and we'll find it towards the end of today's lecture. But last day, we, when discussing convergent evolution, we came upon these spindle cells, which alerted us to the fact that there are commonalities that have something to do with our forms of social organization that we share not based on evolutionary descent. We share these with the apes on that basis, but that arise have arisen independently in cetaceans, so whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and in elephants, 
so that we can see some commonalities, something about the way that we organize our social lives, we have in common not by descent, but independently of that. So biology is not going to give us a very strong guide here. Now we're going to see that that psychological model of individuals who are completely autonomous and separate from each other leads to some very poor science. We're going to look at some sad stories from social psychology, and let me emphasize, we need something like social psychology. We need some form of understanding how we interact, what we achieve collectively, how we depend on each other, what our sets of suites of interrelations are. The problem here that's going to arise is that the strong demand from a public, an eager public, for statements, authoritative statements from science that can guide them and tell them how they should live their lives. Science really should be humble, and such pronouncements are problematic. You know, if you do astrophysics and you observe something in a distant galaxy, that's wonderful, and we all stand back and go, ah, but it doesn't tell us how we should be living our lives. You don't put on an archbishop's hat and tell people what they should be doing. But in social psychology, we get this problem because we have, on the one hand, the scientific enterprise, and on the other hand, we have this thirst on the part of a general public for guidance. And when we're going to look now at three really bad examples of, they're all bad science. Uh, they're bad in different ways. But they all also arose in specific contexts, and you can't understand the science and the, why, there seems, why there's such pressure to generate this kind of bad science. You can't understand that unless you understand the context in which these arose. The first guy we're going to look at, Harry Harlow, was doing his work in the 1950s, and he was fulfilling a need in American society to provide guidance for the kind of thing that people used to know, but that they were feeling unsure about, and the authority of science seemed like a place that they could go for help. You see, American society had undergone very many changes. And after the Second World War, in the 1950s, you had the boom of consumerism. You had the development of the suburbs. You had the valorization of this nuclear family with a mother and a father at the top and 2.2 kids and an Oldsmobile. Um, this was a modern unit that had only... Uh, accidentally existed before, but became the model, the standard against, and, and was driven by a consumer-led society. Products were marketed to this unit, houses were built around this unit, and it's, the result was a society in which people lost some of the supports that they used to have. The extended family, a much bigger family, and the tight-knit community, not these suburban, suburbs built on the edges of great cities, but tight-knit communities with extended families used to contain a kind of a knowledge. And with these societal transformations driven in part by the capitalist expansion after the Second World War, people were unsure. They didn't even know how to raise their own babies. And they turned to the scientists for help. And this, this is the background against which we must understand Harry Harlow's work. Harry Harlow is, to me, the creepiest scientist I know of. He did work on rhesus monkeys, luckily not on humans. I'm glad they didn't let him near humans. And he set out to demonstrate scientifically such things as babies need affection. Now, that that should need a scientist's authority is bizarre. He would did things like, for example, raising baby monkeys in artificial environments removed from their physical mother, and they would have two surrogate mothers. One of them was just a bare wire frame with a feeding bottle, and the other was this attractive creature in a terry cloth. And what you found was these poor traumatized monkeys who had been separated from their mothers they would cling to this piece of terry, terry cloth for a little bit of comfort, and they would dive away and suckle on the bottle of milk and get back. They wouldn't even acknowledge the milk giver as any kind of a mother. It was the warmth that they needed. So therefore, they needed affection. You needed a scientist to tell you that, really? So you don't understand why the science would be done unless you understand what the problems were the society was facing in America, specifically, after the Second World War. There were terms of art used in Harry Harlow's lab, like the pit of despair, which we'll see now is a, a solitary, isolated cage for a monkey. The rape rack, I, this was not made up by critics. These were terms of art in his lab used for force mating of monkeys, uh, and so on. There's the pit of despair. You can see it's this solitary isolation chamber for monkeys. Uh, he was exploring questions of social bonding, the importance of mothers, um, because there was a hunger for people who had lost 
they were undergoing societal transformations that removed some of their supports, and they turned to the scientists on the hope that scientists could provide them with authoritative statements. And you know what? If you ask a scientist to provide some kind of authoritative statement, scientists are stupid enough to get up and do just that. The kind of animal torture that went on in his labs was one of the motivating factors for the rise of the animal liberation movement in the USA. And his experiments are thoroughly despicable, but they are, were a product very much of their time and of this need. We're going to leave Harry Harlow behind. Look him up sometime. There's some interesting footage on the web of horrible machines he made to startle and intimidate little monkeys. Yeah, ghastly stuff. Okay, how many of you had ever heard of Harry Harlow? Two. How many of you have heard of Stanley Milgram? Good deal more, maybe a, maybe a sixth of the class. We're going to turn to Stanley Milgram now. This is from the 19th, so Harlow's works mainly in the 1950s. Now we're going to go to the 1960s to Connecticut and Yale University to a psychologist called Stanley Milgram. But again, we have to understand the context. It's 2016. From here, the Second World War looks like it's a long way away. In the 1960s, the Second World War was not a long way away. That ended in 1945. And there was a wave of shock, absolute horror that went around the world when it became clear what had happened to German society, how it had been transformed into an extermination system in which humans could be exterminated, killed on an industrial scale with the apparent support, collaboration of very many elements within society. This was profoundly unsettling. These days, Germany has been reintegrated into the, into the set of human nations. That took a lot of work. We had the Nuremberg trials of which the top elements of Nazism were skimmed off. But then the hope was that we could stop it there and that the, we could demonstrate that the rest of Germany wasn't intrinsically bad, but that it was this Nazi system that had made it bad. So there was a great deal of interest in studying the relationship between authority and human behavior and human free will. And there was a positive need to demonstrate scientifically that humans who are intrinsically good can be turned bad in the presence of authority. That's a very political agenda, I hope you realize. It's in this backdrop that we turn to Stanley Milgram's work that motivated it. Yale University in Connecticut is one of the Ivy League universities, very, very renowned. They put out this ad looking for people, offering them four quid, four dollars, which is quite a lot of money at the time. And they were looking for people who were unfamiliar with universities. So they went out looking for factory workers, laborers, barbers, clerks, professional people, telephone workers, construction workers, white collar, blue collar workers. They did not, they did not want anyone who was a student in college or a student in high school. They didn't want anyone who was familiar with the university. So people signing up for this study, which was ostensibly the study of me memory and learning, were greeted then at the doors of an Ivy League university, so a very prestigious place, by a scientist, <clears throat> I should be wearing a white coat today, shouldn't I, maybe a funny hat, scientist radiating authority, wearing a white coat, you don't need a white coat for what follows, but they wore white coats in order to illustrate their role. Now, when the subjects signed up for this, they were met then by this scientist taken in, and they were told that they were being randomly assigned to two conditions. They were either going to be a, a learner or a teacher. And then the situation looks like this. The learner is sitting here. The learner is, so, is doing a series of memory tasks and sometimes getting them wrong. And the learner is hooked, hooked up to a machine that administers electric shocks. It's that kind of good psychology, folks. And here's the teacher who's sitting in a different room, can see the learner through a one-way mirror, and the teacher has in front of them a box. This is, uh, so, so the subject is randomly assigned to one of these two. The experimenter sits there. The experimenter administers the tasks to the learner. The learner sometimes gets mistakes, and then the teacher administers electric shocks using this device. This is the box that's used, and the number of switches that are pulled down, this is halfway through when, the, when they start at the left, you're administering 15 volts. When you get up to the right, you're administering something god awful, 450 volts, I think. Now, let's be very absolutely clear about what was going on here. Subjects are being hoodwinked. They are not being randomly assigned to two conditions. The learner is always an actor. The subject is randomly assigned always to the teacher's role. But the subject thinks that they're administering electric shocks, 
no electric shocks are actually administered. This person is an actor. So that's what's going on here. Now that box goes from 15 volts, which is like a little battery, to 450 volts. Don't touch something at 450 volts, it's bad for you. And there was a script as to what, as, as the learner seemed to make errors, the teacher was told to administer ever increasing voltages. And there was a script that determined what the reaction, the response of the learner was to different voltages. We start at 15. At 120 volts, the learner was going to shout in pain, ow! At 150, they were going to say, stop! At 300, they were going to pound on the wall. At 330, they were going to act as if they were unconscious. They're going to stop responding. How far? It goes to 450. How far would you go? That was the question. That was the question that was being asked here, which is how far can you push someone Given the vestiges of authority, you know, the scientist, white coat, and so on, how far can you push them? How far will they go in doing what is clearly immoral? You don't do this to people. Well, here's the results. What's shown on the bottom is the voltage from 15 up to 435, actually, maximum. And there's the percentage of subjects who are administering the shocks. And the triangles that go down here and stop down at the bottom, that's the predictions. And the dots are what actually happened. You see, they predicted that 2% of people would go to the maximum. They found that 65% went to the maximum. That's long beyond the point at which the subject appears to be unconscious. They were egged on. They were told to carry on by the scientists. 65% of them went all the way to the max. Remember these symbols of authority, the lab coat, the proximity. They're stuck in a small room together with the experimenter in a university, which is a very unfamiliar environment, and we've got this authoritative, science -y kind of situation going on, and they're not very well educated. To say that there are ethical issues with this is putting it mildly. This is a form of abuse. These subjects were being tortured. They were traumatized by this. Those subjects who went to 65 were not psychopaths. They were traumatized people who were battered by authority into doing this. They suffered from trauma. A lot of them were broke down in tears. They were crying. Um, it takes some nerve to extricate yourself in this situation. And they were held, trapped in this situation. And they really believed that they were administering these shocks. You would not be allowed to do this experiment today, I'm glad to say. There was recently an attempt to replicate something of the structure of this experiment with much less of the subject abuse. Here are some diagrams from the scientific paper there published recently. But uh, we, so we have a, two conditions, a coercive condition in which an experimenter is looking at someone, and a free choice condition, in which case they're looking away. But the relationship between this so-called replication and Milgram's original study, where subjects were traumatized, is indirect at best. Now, Milgram was a fine scientist. This experiment was accepted in the 60s because it was necessary. People had these questions about authority and they wanted to understand. In fact, they wanted a result. They wanted to know that people are turned bad by authority. This was the only way that people could live with themselves after the Second World War. Six million people have been killed on an industrial scale by some system. If you could prove that it was the system and not the people, that would greatly take a weight off people's shoulders. Now for the third one. These are fun, aren't they? Social psychology is a fun one. Okay, so about a fifth or a sixth of you had heard of Milgram. How many of you have heard of the Stanford Prison Experiment? Yeah, greatest hits from social psychology. This is number one. Again, uh, we're moving up another decade. Start of the 70s, 1971. The context is the same, though, basically. This is shortly after the end. This is only 16 years after the end of the Second World War. And the general topic is the relationship between individuals and authority, structures of authority and to what extent bad behavior can be assigned or attributed to the institutions rather than the individuals. Same kind of motivation. Stanford, uh, California, again one of the very, very greatest of American universities. Philip Zimbardo was the head of the Department of Psychology. And they had a bunch of subjects, and incidentally, all the subjects in Milgram, all the subjects in this, 
And all the subjects, and I think every social psychology experiment ever done up until at least 1990, was male. Women don't exist in this domain. Unless they're monkeys. Think about that one. So in this case, we have all males, and the males are uh, volunteers, and this time they are actually randomly assigned, coin flip, to one of two roles. They're either guards or they're prisoners. And they built a whole mock prison in the basement. And we'll see lots of claims here. Philip Zimbardo, the head of the department, uh, likes to spin this experiment as if we found out that prisoners and guards rapidly adapted to their assigned roles, and this led to some genuinely dangerous and psychologically damaging situations. Now, there is a band called Stanford Prison Experiments. Anyone know the band? Kind of industrial metal band. I, I quite like them. They're kind of old as well. Just because you call something a Stanford Prison Experiment doesn't make it an experiment. So the band is not an experiment. The original Stanford Prison Experiment is also not an experiment. There's no control condition, there's no measurement, there's no data. The thing was never even finished. What it is is more like a piece of performance art or theater designed to reinforce, to argue a particular point. So we've got this drama, we've set up a prison, and they carried this role play to extremes. Prisoners were, quote unquote, arrested at the residences, so by guards, went out, and they were put in handcuffs, put into cards, driven down to the fake prison. And they were treated, given, given prison issue uniforms like dresses. They were treated like prisoners, given limited freedom to exercise or to interact. And again, if you listen to Zimbardo, this is his baby, the guards resorted to tyranny and antisocial behaviors in order to keep the prisoners in line. Here's some photos from the original Stanford experiments. These are the guards. Look, they've got these mirror shades, you know, from Cool Hand Luke. What we have here is a failure to communicate. We've got these either very um, dignity robbing smocks that they're wearing, and they were mistreated. This is another form of abuse. Nobody enjoyed this. The experiment, such as this, was abandoned after six days. It was intended to run for two weeks. It was abandoned at the insistence of Philip Zimbardo's then girlfriend, actually. You probably have heard the popular interpretation of this, that the guards became depersonalized due to their role, and that this caused them to lose their individuality. Remember the context, same context as Milgram. This was already decided that they wanted to find this, because this was the, the goal of the experiment was to take some blame off people. So you hear that the, the tyranny was embedded in the psychology of groups, Groups of people in social roles create group norms. Don't believe this. Don't write that down on an exam as a finding of an experiment. This was not an experiment. No data was collected. No measurement, that is to say, was made. No write-up was conducted. No analysis was made. No journal article resulted from this. You know, to do science, we do experiments. We measure things. We subject them to analyses, and we publish and peer review stuff. None of that happens here. Another thing that happens when you do experiments is you set up your conditions and you stand back. You don't go influencing the data. That's not science. Zimbardo was in the thick of this, egging people on, telling the guards how to behave. So there is footage available, and there's a website run by Zimbardo to document this. He's made a career out of this. He went on to become the head of the American Psychological Association, and we'll see something troubling about that now in a minute. There is plenty of evidence that this simplistic story of bad guards and submissive prisoners is rubbish. Uh, the majority of the guards didn't act tyrannically. Everyone had a rotten time. Um, the claim that the tyranny was a spontaneous product of their role um, is vastly overstated. Zimbardo's role here is, must be seen as polluting the whole thing from the ground up. But the story that's out there is that these guards were depersonalized by their roles. The, sub the prisoners were depersonalized by their roles. And in the context, they couldn't act as free individuals. You can see the echoes of Nazi Germany here. It's very important you understand the context in which this arose. So here's a kind of an uncritical report of it. Guard aggression was emitted simply as a consequence of being in the uniform of a guard and asserting the power inherent in that role. Don't write that on an exam if you're talking about Stanford Prison Experiment. I'll fail you if you do. Okay? 
The really creepy thing here is the role of authority of the scientists. Zimbardo here, running this piece of sh shambolic performance art, but making a living off it. What happens down the line? Remember the Americans invaded Iraq? And they put Saddam Hussein out of business? And Saddam Hussein had a prison on the outskirts of Baghdad called Abu Ghraib. And there was a notorious site in which, Abu, uh, in which Saddam Hussein's regime tortured people, extracted confessions, beat them up, abused them, administered electric shocks, humiliated them, beat them to death sometimes. The Americans took over, and it was business as usual at Abu Ghraib. They tortured prisoners, they beat them up, they smeared them in feces, they set dogs on them, they sexually abused them, they beat them sometimes to death, they photographed them in the most humiliating positions. The Americans did this. That came out and it was something of a scandal, because that's not what they're supposed to be doing. So there was a need to understand what went on now in Abu Ghraib. And there was a couple of show trials. There was a couple of the guards were taken out and were put on trial. And you remember Lindsay England pointing like this. Some of you may remember the iconic images. This is the iconic image of a prisoner there who was tortured like this. Philip Zimbardo was brought in as an expert witness at the Abu Ghraib trial on the grounds that he had been the guy who ran the Stanford prison experiment. Something is wrong here. That wasn't an experiment to start off with. Any claim of authority on the basis of it is entirely inappropriate. And yet, it has been integrated and structured into our narrative that he now appears as an expert witness. Please be critical of this. There's something very, very wrong. There was also an attempt to partially replicate without all the abuse of this in 2006 in, a, in a, something called the experiment, but it is, represents, look into it, it's an unholy mix-up of reality TV and pseudoscience. It was done as a TV show. As part of your required reading, one of the guards who took part in, so I'm going to send you, have you look at Zimbardo's material from this. I want you to see how Zimbardo represents the Stanford prison experiment. I also want you to, see, to read a first-hand report from one of the guards who was in the experiment. Last year, he did an AMA on Reddit. You may know this on Reddit. Sometimes people who've been to the moon or who've been in jail for dealing drugs or otherwise something, some interesting story to tell, they put themselves, make themselves available on Reddit and they answer questions. Well, one of the guards in the original thing, uh, Stanford Prison Experiment did this, and there's a link, and it's on your required reading. Go and read what a guard from this wrote, and compare it to what Philip Zimbardo says about it. I'll give up bashing on social psychology now. We do need help here, but you can see that these, this has been a litany of disasters. Harry Harlow, Stanley Milgram, and Philip Zimbardo represent some of the worst science I know. Part of the problem here is the simplistic assumptions that are being made about people, because people are really complex. They've been treated. Remember the contrast we drew between the ants and the primates. The ants had these little roles, and some of the things that they did were interpreted with respect to the colony, and some with respect to the ant. And that was a simple kind of thing. And we get the primates, the apes and the monkeys, and we're completely different. We're always negotiating our roles. We're forming political liaisons. We're collaborating, and we're arguing, and we're scrambling up the hierarchy, and we're maintaining our position, and we're representing ourselves. This is not what an ant does. Primates are not ants. The idea that there's a simple, simple individual is entirely discreet, that is then polluted by the structures of authorities to treat us like ants. And so some of the underlying assumptions about the simple notion of minds, that minds are things that individuals have hidden away somewhere inside their heads that, that are responsible for everything, this is part of the problem. So we need to broaden our notion of mind. Cognitive science is not psychology. Cognitive science needs to take a view on psychology. Psychology is one of the contributions anthropology, neuroscience, linguistics, computer science, philosophy, we need them all. And the joy of cognitive science, the challenge as well, is getting these disciplines to speak to each other so you can recognize the strengths and limitations of each. We're not forced to adopt a single template when it comes to understanding people. And I hope people will remain an object of negotiation rather than scientists coming out and telling you who and what you are and how you're supposed to behave. We didn't like that when bishops did it to us. Scientists shouldn't be doing it to, to us either. Happily, 
There are currently, I mean, one of the main features of cognitive science at the moment is the plurality of approaches. There's an awful lot of different approaches, and they're not all talking about the same thing, and they're not all adopting the same view with respect to minds. We're going to just mention two recent innovations here, that is, sort of within the last 20 years, that can help us to broaden our notion of cognition, broaden our notion of mind, and avoid some of these traps. Recognize the complexity of what we're dealing with. We're not going to get simple answers. These two approaches we're going to mention are the extended mind and distributed cognition. And crucially, neither of these is terrifically radical. There are way more radical proposals out there. They're both going to assume that the basic language that was introduced around the middle of the 20th century which speaks of information processing, symbol manipulation, representation, and treats uh, the processes of cognition as if they were a kind of computation. They're going to both stick with that sort of vocabulary. One can leave that behind. There are more radical approaches. But even there, they're going to just let drop one thing, the assumption that brains are doing all this. And we've already noted our propensity for projecting onto brains, right? It's always dangerous. The extended mind hypothesis we look at first, it uses the conventional language of cognitive science, assuming that we're trying to understand things like perceiving, remembering, planning, and solving. This kind of focus on largely intellectual pastimes. What the extended mind hypothesis points out is that if you try to understand how you do these, if you look in detail at these, they're not all done inside heads. They're done out using things in the world. As a simple banal example, if you shut me off from my computer, I'm about 10 times dumber. I know much more if I have my computer, my tools around me, than I do if I don't. As you're sitting here, you're paying attention and you're learning, and you're, but you're also writing and taking notes. And later on, you'll refer to those notes. So at, at issue here is when we look at how we do things like remembering and planning, What's involved, and is it plausibly all in the brain? That seems to be a kind of a prejudice or a bias and a, a non-theoretical, a, a starting assumption that we could drop. So the two philosophers involved, Andy Clark, who's in Edinburgh, and Dave Chalmers from Australia, suggested this kind of thing I call the parity principle. If, as we confront some task, a part of the world functions as a process which if it was done in the head, we'd call cognitive then that part of the world is part of the cognitive processes. Cognitive processes are not all in the head. That's their hypothesis, but they illustrate this with a couple of well-worked examples that bring it home. It's a fairly simple point. And I think the example that they use to illustrate it brings this home clearly. It involves two individuals who live in New York. One is called Anna, and one is called Otto. And they both get up on Saturday morning, and they both decide they'd like to go to visit the Museum of Modern Arts, which is on 42nd Street. Let's look at them. Anna plans to go to the museum. She remembers it's on 42nd Street, and she gets the bus there. Hooray for Anna. Otto has Alzheimer's. I forgot to mention that. I'm getting a bit myself. <laughs> he's quite good at it, though. He's, he's learned to make use of things. So he keeps, he keeps a notebook where he writes a lot of stuff down because he knows his memory is not trustworthy. He also wants to go to the museum. And he doesn't just remember. He takes out his notebook, looks it up. Ah, there's where I wrote down the address of the museum. So he remembers using the notebook. And then he gets the bus and go there. So both Anna and Otto planned to go to the museum. They remembered where the museum was, and they mastered the task of getting to the museum. The process of remembering, well, in one case it involves a notebook, and in the other it doesn't involve a notebook. And the question is, is that an important distinction? Should we read, should we say, <clears throat> in this case, Otto is not doing the same thing as Anna is doing, or is he just doing the same thing but just using different means? Anna is presumably doing the remembering in her head, whatever that means. Otto is clearly using the notebook. And they're arguing that, well, it seems on the face of it as if we don't really have a basis for saying that the notebook is not part of the remembering. Why would we say that? So this extended mind hypothesis has opened the door to a whole bunch of new ways of thinking about minds, not as being inside heads at all, but as being distributed in the world, in our patterns of interaction, in our tools and devices, in our institutions, in our habits, in lots of different things. It's a useful 
tonic to take rather than assuming that everything goes on inside the skull. But there's a lot of work to be done here to make this work. If minds are not all in the brain or in the skull, then maybe cognition isn't even all in the individual. And that's what we're going to move on to next. But before we do, notice how all this revolves around the way that you interpret the word mind or the way that you interpret the word cognition. Or in this case, to be more specific, the way that you interpret the word remember. These words don't explain themselves, and we don't have solid definitions of them. It's a matter of negotiation. Frame things one way, and you'll see minds one way. Frame things another way, you'll see minds a different way. So the discussion of mind and the discussion of cognition are very much work in progress. It's one of the most frustrating and challenging and interesting nice things about cognitive science, is that the very topic of discussion itself remains undefined. This is probably good and might help to prevent us making um, claims of authority we don't have grounds for, like the examples we've seen today. Before we move on to distributed cognition, I want to just say a word about the term extended mind, which comes out of this famous paper from 1998 by Andy Clark and Dave Chalmers and has spawned a little industry. There are now conferences on extended mind. Lots of people have done PhDs on it. There are books on the topic of extended mind. However, the term extended mind has also been appropriated by some others for other purposes. And I'll mention Mr. Rupert Sheldrake here, who's a kind of a psychologist who investigates parapsychology, telepathy, and lots of pseudoscience. And he uses the term extended mind to mean something like woo ether through which we communicate with each other. That's not a scientific use. So be warned that the term extended mind is used in more than one way. And we're going to move on instead to look at the work of Ed Hutchins, who was an anthropologist who went off and studied the means of navigation among tribes in Papua New Guinea. You know anthropologists always going over to New Guinea to study stuff. But then he came back to America and he got funding from the, the Navy and from the Air Force and he started studying soldiers and, and, and air traffic controllers and sailors and that kind of thing. And he wrote this influential book and came out in the mid-1990s called Cognition in the Wild. And what's interesting about Ed Hutchins is he describes cognition in conventional terms. He describes it as information processing, using representations in order to solve things like planning or navigation, for example. But he doesn't assume that it's been done by an individual. He says, if we ascribe to individual minds in isolations the properties that actually belong to systems, and the systems are composed of individuals manipulating artifacts, then we've attributed something to individual minds that they don't necessarily have. And we fail to ask about the processes they actually must have in order to use the tools in order to generate to solve the task. He says, this is a frequently committed error. Now, these, he's looking at very well-defined situations. Cognition in the wild is a clever kind of way of phrasing what he does. he does. He goes to find sort of natural experiments, that is, highly constrained environments in which people solve well-defined tasks. So that's all very much like an experiment. But they're doing this anyway, whether the observer is there or not. And so a ship's control brig in the Navy is a perfect example. You've got a well-defined task navigating the ship. You've got a bunch of people who are involved in doing it. You know exactly who they are and what their roles are. They have well-defined jobs. And together, they solve something. Air traffic control is another example of this kind of domain. So he's worked on these very constrained environments with well-defined tasks. And he's using a conventional language, suggesting that cognition is a form of information processing. But the representations, he's not talking about some kind of brain stuff. He's talking about maps. Remember when we started talking about representations, we used maps as an example to find our feet? Well, he's gone back there and he's saying, yeah, let's take those maps as representations. Those are used in solving the problem. And look at the tools that people use. So he's making a bold claim here, as is the extended mind. The boundaries of cognition are not known in advance. They don't necessarily stop with the individual. They might involve brains, internal stuff, also body stuff and world stuff and structures. They might be socially distributed, temporally distributed, spatially distributed. We don't know in advance. This seems to me to be a huge improvement from a kind of disastrous social psychology that treated people like ants to recognizing that we, are, we partake in lots of complex forms of social organization 
which need to be understood in their own right. Not having a simple authority versus the individual, that kind of caricature. Hutchins again, he says, the emphasis on finding and describing knowledge structures inside an individual encourages us to overlook the fact that all our cognition is already situated in a complex social cultural world which is greatly affected by it. So don't just look at the head, don't just look at the person, look at, look at the whole context in which it happens. Look at the patterning of activity across people that facilitates all this. And in many respects, Hutchins' view of knowledge allows us to recognize that scientific knowledge itself is a collective activity, it's a form of distributed cognition. No one scientist knows much, really, and any, the beliefs on any one scientist are going to be totally off the wall crazy. I mean, you see mine, you wouldn't believe me, I hope. Um, science, however, is a collective enterprise which has, is stored in conferences and journals and writings and books. Um, it's not in one person. So when we speak of scientific knowledge, we're never speaking of what Fred knows or what Einstein knows. We're speaking of the product of a lot of collective activity. And as we look at things that we achieve collectively, we might decide to come at the whole business of accounting for behavior in a slightly different way. Rather than assuming that we know what's going on inside heads and what individuals are, we might look at the collective behavior and then ask, well, what's the best way of explaining what we're looking at? It might be that we're dealing with highly complex individuals and that the collective behavior is attributable to those. It might not be, though. Especially when more than one person is involved, we see phenomena that seem to describe, require a different form of, des of description. So let me give you an example here. Here's a, uh, oh, you don't really need sound. There's a football stadium, and there's a Mexican wave. The collective <laughs> Stuttgarter Daimler Stadion. Science to be done here? You betcha. You can describe things like what's the minimum number of people required? Why does it go one way rather than the other way? What are the conditions under which it arises and what are the conditions under which it goes away? What are the forms of interaction among people? Does it matter whether they see each other? We can have lots of scientific questions about this kind of collective behavior. And that can lead to mathematical modeling where you try to reproduce those exactly those kind of phenomena. And there's a chap in Hungary, Thomas Vizek, who was here a couple of months ago, and he's got a lovely mathematical model of this. Here's the result of a simulation of his model. See the little propagation of a Mexican wave there among his little computational people. It's a lovely model, and it explains an awful lot of the phenomena that we see in Mexican waves. How does it account for the behavior? Not by assuming that people have these complex internal secret minds. That's not how it's done. He took an existing model based on the propagation of electrical signals in heart tissue from one cell to the other, based on chick hearts. And he modified it for this case. And the crucial thing here is that the modeler who's trying to account for some kind of collective achievement has to worry how much complexity should we put in the individual and how much should we put in the interactions among the individuals. That's the key here. You have to worry about both things at the same time, a model of the individual and the model of the interactions and a model of the circumstances, the context in which things take place. This seems like a more productive way to acknowledge the kind of richness and uh, variability we see in human social behavior. Remember, we're primates, we're not ants. We engage in all kinds of weird forms of collective behavior. For some of them, we could, it's enough to treat us as simple beings. In a Mexican wave, we're just doing this. We don't need a complicated internal model. We're going to finish up with one last foray into social psychology because um, you'll see a lot of poorly informed articles out there about the dangers of social media, for example. Facebook gives you cancer, right? You'll see a lot of nonsense about this, the deleterious effects of video games. There's some of the worst. So social psychology still has a need to pronounce and tell you that you're doing it wrong. It's taken over almost the role of the bishop in wagging its finger at people. And some of this is dreadful science. We're about to see some very famous Dreadful science. This is a report in the Irish Times a couple of years ago, shamefully reported by Dick Alstrom, who was reporting on some research. And this is a quote from the Irish Times. He's talking about Facebook and how people have lots of friends. You know, I've got 700 Facebook friends. 
He said, your actual circle of friends was much smaller and, get this, could not physically exceed a maximum of 150 due to a limit set by the brain. This figure has become known as Dunbar's number. What in hell is going on here? Your brain is setting a physical limit on the number of friends. Do I have to convince you that there's something wrong here? <laughs> I hope not. There is something wrong here. This, first of all, it's terrible journalism. Okay. But it's not, it, so the journalist is not wearing his critical thinking cap, but the research is deeply, deeply flawed as well. If you don't think there's something wrong with that, go have a cup of coffee. We, we can talk afterwards, okay? <laughs> the rest of us will, will carry on. So, yeah, and if you claim that your brain imposes a physical limit of 150 on the number of friends, I'll fail you with a moment's heartbeat. Right? Where did that nonsense come from? It came from a chap in Oxford, Robin Dunbar, who, like the Barter, has made a career out of this. And what he did was he took a bunch of data from a bunch of species and he looked at the size of their brain, specifically the volume of the cortex, the neocortex, and he looked at the, the known group size of these. Now, I don't know what a human group size is, but if you go look at this, you can say something about the average size of a chimpanzee troop, for example, or elephant families and things like this. And he plotted, he made a plot here, here is brain size, or the, the relative importance of the neocortex, to be more precise. And here's the mean group size, and it seems to be a linear relationship. And this was all real data that he had. And then based on that, without measuring, so we also know the size of the human brain, which we can put on here, and then we can read off, um, here's the problem. Then we can say, oh look, humans should have a group size of 150. Come on. Right. There's many ways to criticize this. This is, without a shadow of a doubt, dreadful science. If you establish a correlation, a linear relationship between here and here, you can use that as the basis under some circumstances, if you're careful, you can use that as the basis for prediction of new cases as long as they lie within this range and this range. You have no license to use it outside of the range in which you establish it. No relationship in nature is linear for all possible values. It's always bounded. So the way to use correlational data is to make predictions within the range in which you establish it. We are completely off the scale here. We know humans have freakishly enlarged forebrains. He knew this as well. Imagine, well, let's just put up these first. Correlation is, of course, not causation. It's not telling us this. Look at what's underlying this. The idea that there's some state of nature to which we could get back. The idea that there's a natural size for human groups. That's a religious idea. It's not a scientific idea. The extrapolation to humans here is not licensed. You're not allowed to use correlations like that. We differ from the primates in this study in many, many, many ways. And we know that we have freakishly enlarged neocortices. Look, every animal has something special about them. Giraffes have big, long necks. Do you ever notice a giraffe's neck? They're kind of freaky. Right? Penguins are really good at withstanding the cold. And birds of paradise have this cool dance that they do. Look it up sometime. Humans, they got these freakishly enlarged forebrains. We know that going in. Can you imagine giraffe scientists looking at other mammals and trying to make predictions about them based on, their, based on neck size? That would be a giraffe interpreting all the other animals as if they were little giraffes. And they're not, because the giraffes have freakishly big necks. Humans have freakishly big forebrains. It's not a good lens to view other animals through, and it's an even rotten one to view other animals through it, then come back and suggest that this tells us how we should be living. Facebook gives you cancer, if you remember one thing from this lecture. Facebook gives you cancer. The number of bad studies out there in this domain is unbelievable. Yet this Dunbar's number is commonly reproduced in the press. It's used to justify, and this is, it has in common with Stanford Prison Experiment, Milgram's Experiment, and Harry Harlow's Experiment, normative claims telling people what they ought to do. That's where I want you to be alerted, to be cautious. Just be critical. When someone tells you how you should behave, don't just accept it. And just because they're wearing a scientist's white coat, which I forgot today, I'm sorry, uh, don't believe them just because of that. Normative conclusions are always to be approached with suspicion. Our terms in studying ourselves are very uncertain, in need of a great deal of negotiation. Be cautious.
We'll get back to some better science again next Tuesday, okay? Next Thursday, we won't have a lecture. I'll send out an email about that later on, on the way.